Hello and welcome to another out of spec reviews video. Now, just a couple days ago, you and I went through all of the specs, pricing, features, everything on the Hyundai Ioniq 6. Well, today it's time where I'm able to drive it for the first time. So I'll give you a little refresher course on the highlight specs, tell you about the model we're driving, but I am holding the key to the Hyundai Ioniq 6 and I'm now able to drive it. So let's not waste any time. These are my favorite videos to make. And here it is in digital green over the gray and green interior. It's actually, I believe, labeled as green on green interior, which it's definitely not. This is the spec to have an Ionic 6. This is the big battery, all wheel drive. So 77.4 kilowatt hour gross battery pack, dual motor, 320 horsepower, about 76 kilowatts on the front motor, a hundred and something on the back. I can't remember offhand, but a larger rear motor than front. It is the identical battery and drivetrain setup to the Hyundai Ioniq 5 that you and I have driven many times together. Now, there are other versions you can get this car in. You can get it with a small battery rear wheel drive. That's 53 kilowatt hours, I believe. Very small battery pack. Still 240 miles of range, only 149 horsepower. And there's not many of those coming to the US. That's just really for them to advertise a base price, in my opinion. Then you can get up to the large battery rear wheel drive, 305 miles of EPA rated range. And that's gonna be a pretty spicy machine. Uh, that's with the big wheels. If you go for the small wheels, that's going to be 368 miles of range or 361, right up there above 360 miles. Crazy huge range numbers. We are going to, of course, test that in the real world in an upcoming video at some point. But, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of, again, there's two wheel and tire configurations. There's a small wheel and a big wheel, 18 or 20 inch, I believe. This one is the 20 inch wheel. These are 245, 40, 20s. They're a Pirelli tire, a P0, and it's a fully electric optimized OE tire. Let's see if it's on a staggered setup here. So we're gonna be looking, we have 245 front and rear, so a square setup, perfect for the big skids. You guys know I prefer cars on a square setup uh, for performance driving because it's kind of fun, but uh, also 245 all around, that's pretty good. That's a you know, pretty normal size tire, I would say. Hyundai always does their chassis engineering just second to none. You can see the flaps up front are open because I have the air conditioning on. Those will close under cruising for a little bit better aero and range. So love to see some active aero or at least moving parts on there, if you will. There's a small front trunk. There's a rear trunk. I showed you all of that in the previous video. If you haven't watched it, don't forget to watch. And um, this one is the fully maxed out version. So just back to that, you get two different wheel options. The small wheels are only available if you get the base trim and that's where you get the most range. Unfortunately, you can't get all the stuff and all the range, but what you probably could do is just swap on the aero wheels, the little moon discs, onto a more expensive trim at a later point in time. Maybe run two sets of wheels and tires if you're so inclined. One thing I always mention though is range anxiety really doesn't exist once you own an electric car. This is my experience. And um, you know, it's all about charging anxiety more than range anxiety. And this thing charges really fast, 240 kilowatts deep into the pack as well. 18 minutes, 10 to 80%. It is as expected from the Hyundai Ioniq 5, Kia EV6, and others. Now I've conveniently parked it this way so you don't have to look at the back of it, but I will show you very briefly and I'm really sorry that I have to show you this because I think, <laughs> I don't know what's going on back here, at least in this color and trim, not loving the back of this thing. The Ionic 5 is so much cooler in my opinion than the Ionic 6, um, but some people prefer a sedan and some people want more range and this car definitely gives you that. It just looks so good in my opinion up to about here. And then everything here back, ooh. But that's not what we're getting into in this video. We are getting into the driving dynamics of this thing. So um, what do we have for suspension, powertrain, and all of that stuff? Here's what I'm gonna let you know. And so what we have is a completely fixed suspension, non-adaptive damper in this particular model. It is a uh, five-link rear 
suspension. I'm not sure what's going on up front in this particular one, if it uses the multi-link like EV6 GT does or how it's actually set up. Couldn't find any details. We're on, again, square setup for the tire. We have a larger rear motor than the front. We have typical Hyundai over-engineering on everything. It should be really good. I'm expecting it to be really good. I'm expecting it to feel like an Ionic 5 in sedan form. And the first thing that lets me, sort of leads me to believe that is the seating position is quite high. Uh, for a sedan. In a Model 3, you really fit, feel like you can sit nice and low in that car. This car, not the case. You can see this one was built in January of 2023. Start of production is underway. They are in dealerships. The US does not get the digital mirrors, sadly. This is my eye level, the camera position right now. So you're sitting quite high in the vehicle uh, compared to others where you might have a nice low like Taycan experience. Not the case here, unfortunately. I was really hoping to have a sportier driving position. Uh, beautiful seats in this particular car. Good back seat room as well. It's quite large back there. It is pretty sparse. There are air vents but um, and USB-C ports. But what's weird is you do have a USB-A port right there. So anyway, I, I've already taken you on the tour of all of this stuff. Let me get the cameras up. Let's get to driving and we'll talk Ionic 6 driving Welcome dynamic. to the inside of the Ionic 6 now. And uh, you know, it's sunny outside, 77 degrees. And I'm just a little surprised. The AC is quite loud in this car. Just the fan noise pushing through the vents. I'm on fan two and it's it feels like it'd be on fan seven out of 10 or six out of 10 at that noise. That's pretty interesting. So you join me in the Ionic 6 and a um, couple things to get out of the way. First of all, it's built on the same platform as Ionic 5. So it really should drive pretty much the same. So I'm going to be looking forward to seeing how that goes. This is really my, I've just moved it up here, but really my first driving impressions of the car. And, um, you know, I will say just, just moving it around slightly over the last little bit drives pretty much similar to Ionic 5. So if you don't want to watch the video, I'm sure that's going to be the case at the end of it, but we will have to see. I'm going to try it in performance driving, gentle driving, listen to noise, one pedal calibration, all of that stuff. I'm keeping the sunroof shade closed. It's a very small sunroof here in the car. It's quite wide, but still a uh, pretty, pretty small opening traditional sunroof. Nothing like the glass canopy you would get in a Model 3. Uh, again, this opens, that one wouldn't. So drive modes, we have eco, normal, and sport. I just wanna talk a little bit about what each does in relation to drivetrain control. You see this car uses two permanent magnet motors. And what that means is if you're just cruising down the highway, you really only need one motor working. And the secondary motor that may not be applying power is actually creating drag. Now, if you have an induction motor, there's still some parasitic losses, but nothing like a permanent magnet motor where this could have one, two, three kilowatts of equivalent drag just being locked up. So what Hyundai did on the eGMP platform, there are other cars that are starting to have this now too, is have a clutch disconnect of the front drive axle. So it means that the primary axle is the rear axle, the secondary axle is the front. That's how an electric car should be. It means that it should be a little bit oversteery and more performance oriented, which is great. Um, and it also means while cruising, you're gonna unlock that front motor, it's gonna be sitting idle and you're just gonna be pushed along by the rear. That's awesome. Um, now, when is it disconnected? Well, it's disconnected all the time when I'm in eco mode. Eco mode is a pretty much only disconnect right there. Let me just check to make sure the camera view isn't, isn't too bad here. I think we're good. Um, yeah, disconnected all the time in eco mode. When I'm in normal mode, which is the key up setting under light throttle, it's fully disconnected until I go hard throttle. Then what it does is it rev matches the front motor so that your input and output shafts are the same, locks the clutch up, and then you're good to go. And that all happens fairly quickly. It's not instant. And I actually think they slowed it down a little bit on newer software, just so there's less of an NVH um, crash or jarring motion. Here, you can barely feel it. It's a really nicely optimized thing, or it could just be brand new clutches, I don't know. But, but nice work, at least when I just tried it, sampled it. We'll talk about that. And then when I'm in sport mode, the front axle's connected all the time. Also, if I'm in snow mode, which is pushing and holding, snow mode is connected. You can actually see the pixels here on the, the steering wheel just flashed, indicating I was going into snow mode. Oh, they go red for sport, green for eco, white for normal. That's kind of cool, love that. That's, uh, that's fun, I hope the camera can pick that up. Yeah, just barely, but that's really, really cool. I like that the pixels are lit on the steering wheel. So. We're gonna drive in normal mode to start. There's also a whole bunch of regen modes. There's level zero, one, two, and three, and that just increases the amount of off-throttle regen. Then I can push and hold the left paddle, which goes into eye pedal mode. Actually, it's just a pull 
I got that wrong. You keep clicking up into eye pedal mode. Eye pedal mode locks up the front motor all the time. So pretty much no matter the mode that you're in, the car will be all wheel drive in eye pedal. And that's just because you're gonna go from throttle to slow down to acceleration to slow down. And to save the clutches some wear over the life of the vehicle, eye pedal will keep the front motor connected all the time. That's actually how I would suggest driving the vehicle. It reduces wear and tear on that uh, clutch, which shouldn't really be something you have to think about. Um, but also it just is less moving parts. So I really like that right there. The other thing that I'm going to be doing here is when you're just driving normally, let's say you're in regen level one, you don't want that much off throttle regen. You just push and hold the left paddle and that goes to maximum deceleration. So similar to like the Chevy Bolt with the regen trigger on the wheel or Ionic 5 or the, even the original Ionic Konas, not Ionic Kona, Hyundai Kona electrics. Those, you can always pull the left paddle and get the most amount of regen given at any time. This is no exception. So lots of regen settings. And there's more. I can actually go all the way to the right on the regen paddle by holding it to the right, and then I'm in automatic regen. And what that means is it's gonna prioritize coasting, which is the most efficient way. And as I come up on another vehicle, it actually is camera-based the Hyundai guys were saying instead of radar based. I don't know that to be totally true. I wasn't talking to an engineer as a product planner. Um, I bet it's radar based, but okay. They said it was camera based. Uh, and then you're in auto mode. And what's funny about auto mode is there's different levels of auto regen. There's, let's just count them. One, two, three, four, five levels of auto regen, which I assume just increases the level of off throttle deceleration and sensitivity to the car in front. I mean, if you compare this, it, the best way I can do it is Tesla is Apple. They don't give you very many settings. Everything just works and it's great. And this is Android where you have a million different drive modes and settings that the nerds will really love, the Android users, if you will. And, um, but like you got to really dial in the car to get it to what you want. What's funny is I actually love both of them. <laughs> so I really love how much adjustability this car gives me. I can really dial in everything I want. There's also a custom drive mode that I can go in and create as well. So I'm going to take us out of auto regen because I'm not really a huge fan of that. I'm going to put it into eye pedal. Normal mode eye pedal is how I drive the car most of the time. So the one thing I just want to try really quick is the low speed inching around stuff. And this is where Hyundai and Kia have always excelled is uh, you know, the low speed calibration, having a perfect one pedal calibration, having really smooth tip in, very little motor cogging, especially for permanent magnet motors. It just decelerates, comes to a stop and locks us in. It's second to none, uh, actually even better than Tesla in my opinion, one pedal calibration. My only complaint about the one pedal in the Ionic 5 is when I come up to a stop sign, for example, which actually I'm just gonna do right here because no one's around, I'm lift off, I'm in eye pedal, this is full deceleration, I want more regen, give me more. And especially at about five miles an hour, it backs off a little bit and just comes right to a perfect stop. I mean, you, this is textbook perfect. I would just want a little bit more deceleration. Now, when I touch the brake pedal in this car, it is a brake by wire. And what that means is it's actually a computer system. Let me make sure I'm going the right way here because I'm actually gonna go pick up Anna who's over at the hotel we're staying at and we're gonna do some efficiency testing in this thing today. Um, there's birds in the road, horn test. Whoa, get out of the road, vultures. Um, this horn rocks. That has to be the loudest, meanest horn you could put. It just sounds like it's, you can hear it in the next county over. So <laughs> passes the horn test. All right, back to the brake pedal. The brake pedal's brake by wire. What it means is my one input goes to a computer system that has to figure out how much deceleration it wants from the electric motors and how much deceleration it wants from the friction service brakes, the disc brakes front and rear. And, um, Hyundai has mastered the brake by wire system better than anyone. And what that means is when I come on the brake pedal quickly, hard, it's gonna go physical brakes, full ABS. Ready, boom. Just right there, full ABS. <laughs> and it just yelled at me because iPedal wasn't available, but now it's back on. So definitely like amazing braking performance. It just gets, gets stopped instantly. They have a really good ABS calibration. 
the braking is awesome in this car. But when I just tip into the braking, even an eye pedal, I'm actually getting slightly more regen. And then when it maxes out its regen, it is uh, blending in service brakes. So that's like, a, that's the idea. Most automakers fail at this, to be totally honest. Most of them have, they get tripped up, you feel the weird situations all the time, you hear weird clicking in actuators, Volvo for example, the thing's always clicking and making weird noises. This rocks. So from an input perspective, from a driving dynamics perspective, Hyundai has always been king and it's the same with this car right here. The throttle pedal is totally adjustable and tunable to the drive mode you would want. In normal mode, it's a long pedal. The harder I push it, it keeps adding power all the way down to wide open throttle. It's a uh, very quick car. We'll talk about the acceleration bit in a bit. And then the brake pedal just does exactly what I want when I want. It's a firm brake pedal. It's tuned perfectly. And that is what you're paying for when you get these Hyundai Kia cars. Just the engineering that goes into driving is truly second to none. Okay, the accelerator pedal bit. So let's try a launch. That's usually a good way to start. I'm going to go full traction control off, push and hold everything completely off. So what we'll do is we'll go left foot hard on the brake, flooring with the right, and rip it. Front wheel spin right there, and 60. So it ramps pretty hard to about 40 miles an hour. 40 is when it seems to give you full power, and then you're just kind of sitting there. And one thing we know about this drivetrain is the thermal longevity is amazing. Just take a look at my EV6 a GT driving review up in the canyons, pounding on that car, and it never cared. This is a, the same battery pack for the most part, and similarly designed motors. Those were a little bit uprated, but you get the idea. Um, so I love the drivetrain on this car. I love the acceleration. is more than anyone would ever need. 320 horsepower is really fast. Now in sport mode, which we are in right now, when I floor it really quick, it's gonna be instant because the front motor is connected and I can pull that screen up right here. So three, two, one, floor it, boom, instant power, no delay, just big torque. That's great. <laughs> but if I actually put it in normal mode and I take it out of iPedal, take a look at this. Uh, and I know we're coming into town, but I'm not gonna go very quickly. Under regen, it's actually using the front motor. But if I just coast it here, the front motor should disconnect. Why is that not disconnecting? Okay, maybe it needs a little bit more coasting power um, coming out of uh, one of these drive modes. But essentially what's going to happen when I demonstrate this, ooh, we need to go to the right. Apologies to everyone around me. Uh, me and navigating, you know, this is the two things that don't typically go very well together. So normal mode, cruising, when we get up to speed, it should disconnect the front axle. When that happens, I'm going to floor it, and what you're gonna feel is the rear motor give us everything it can, and then the front motor is going to quickly spin up, clutch match, and rip. What's interesting though is it's not actually disconnecting. I have regen, let's just say, pretty much backed off. We're in normal mode, sport eco. Let's try going from eco to normal. So eco mode, front axle still connected. Oh, duh, I got traction control off. Here we go, traction control on, front motor disconnected, normal mode, so this is as it really should be. So we're normal mode, disconnected, I'm gonna floor it, you'll feel the rear and then the front will connect, boom. So really fast reconnect time in a situation like that from a coasting to wide open throttle request, um, but no NVH, no shaking, just instant connect and go. Let's do it one more time. Three, two, one. Unbelievable how good that is. Unbelievable. They have just nailed the engineering of this stuff. It's so crazy. The other thing I like is that Hyundai and Kia really built the battery pack, the motors, the drive systems, the high voltage architecture being a you know close to 800 volt system architecture all in house. And that is, uh, you know, just shows how well this car performs. You really feel that, uh, at least I do when I drive the car. It's just like, wow, everything works together so perfectly from a drivetrain and chassis perspective. So the driving of the Ionic 6 is truly the highlight. Let's talk noise and ride quality. The suspension is a fixed suspension on this car. And I'm talking specifically about, um, you know, I'm driving the one on the big wheels. I think we're gonna see very few of them on the aero wheels, the 18 inch, which is why I selected this top spec model. This should drive the same as an SEL, but the SE models with the aero wheels will probably ride even slightly better with a taller tire. 
Um, so from a suspension standpoint, it's a fixed steel static suspension. It cannot, it's not adjustable. There's no air, nothing like that. And I would say it's the perfect compromise for this. And very rarely do I call things perfect. You know me, I'm, I'm a fairly critical reviewer uh, because I think things should be you know, much better. You're spending $60,000 almost for this car. This one's 57, I wanna say, after destination. It should be really good. Not only is the suspension really good, it's perfect. What that means is it's not perfect in any single category. It's the spider web of all the different type of driving that this car has to do. It's very well suited for. It has enough ground clearance to go down a dirt road. It has enough sporty elements where I can hustle this thing on some twisties and really rip it and lean into the suspension and put the car on that tire and have some fun driving it, especially with the rear motor having even more power. So I love that. I also love that the suspension is smooth and comfortable. Over big bumps, you really feel it soak up. So they tuned this suspension so well for this car, given the compromise. It's softer than a Model 3, but yet still feels just as fun in the corners from a suspension standpoint. It's not gonna be as fast as a Model 3. That car feels a little bit more nimble. This is a bigger car. It's six inches longer, it's taller, it's wider, but you get the, you get the idea. Um, so suspension is great. Noise. Aside from the air conditioning noise, just the fan being really loud, I'm just going to turn that off really quick. It is very quiet. Very quiet. And uh, that's something that's very important in an electric car, to have a quiet cabin, especially over big impacts, especially cruising on the highway at high speed. The nature of this car having a 0.22 coefficient of drag. Actually, the spec I'm driving is 0.24 coefficient of drag because I've got the bigger wheels. Um, so just the nature of it being way slipperier than an Ionic 5 also means better sound performance. And what's crazy is they were able to do that with single pane glass. So single pane glass front and rear. There's no window switches on the side door. I gotta look here. I'm just double checking. Sorry, this one has double pane glass in the front. What about the back? Maybe that's why it's so quiet. Yeah, double pane glass all around. Surprising. I don't remember the Ionic 5 having that. I thought that had single pane. So this has two very thin uh, panes of glass. It's not like a, you know, it's not like an i7 that has really thick glass or anything like that. But even then, you feel like you're in your own little sound recording booth in this thing, if you will. It's very, very nicely tuned, very nice and quiet. So very pleased there. And it seems, you know, I, I blasted on the highway very quickly in this. It seems it's just as quiet on the highway. We'll do some highway driving here in a moment as well. Um, the size of the car, the cabin's the right size. It rides really well. It drives really well. It does all the stuff that makes this car pretty much almost untouchable for any competition to get near it. But then it goes downhill very quickly because the integration of the user and this car, which I really talked about when I did the walk around, is annoying. Um, the route planning, for example, sucks. It routes you to, eight, I put it, I'm here in Phoenix, and I said, take me to Colorado, back to Fort Collins. And it said, you're gonna stop at this AC charger for 15 hours and this one for 12 hours, and it's like, no, that's not good. There's also no plug and charge. Hyundai was like, oh, well, we're gonna wait for it to become a, you know, a real thing in the US before we add plug and charge. Well, guess what? It is a real thing, and it's a real thing with your charging partner at Electrify America. The car needs to have plug and charge. It also needs on route battery preconditioning that works below 20% state of charge. So in the winter time, you have to arrive at high state of charge to get fast charging speeds. Now, I know why they do that because they want to increase efficiency of the vehicle at low state of charge, but Hyundai owners aren't dumb. They bought these cars. The people driving these things, these are the nerds right now. Let the give the car what the customer wants or give the customer control over the car, I should say. And so just the the EV integration aspects of the car is kind of where it starts to fall apart. And then you get to the dealer network, which is awful at best. The amount of dealers we saw charging well over sticker for these things was insane. Now, I asked them about how many units they're expecting to sell and ramping production, and they basically said, for Ionic 5, we saw such huge demand, we're running the factory flat out. For this car, we're gonna run the factory flat out. And they're really trying to match demand with, uh, you know, with enough supply, but, um, you know, it, it's pretty tough. 
And the other thing is, you don't get a $7,500 tax credit on this car. You only get the tax credit if you lease it, which is a weird loophole of our tax law. But if you lease this car, they will apply the full $7,500, I believe, as a cap cost reduction, essentially acting as a down payment on your lease of $7,500 over the you know financed portion, not the big... Um, you know, balloon portion at the end, if you will, that's when it goes back to Hyundai. So that's better than taking $7,500 off the MSRP of the car, and it should lead to this thing leasing out pretty well. Um, there's actually great lease deals going on in EV right now all around. Mercedes EQS at $550, $600 bucks a month. Um, great deals out there if you're into leasing, but a lot of people like to buy their stuff, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a make or break to not buy it or buy it because the tax credit still is only for a very narrow group of people that make between certain incomes that they can take advantage of the full thing. But it is a consideration that you know a base Model 3 at the time of this recording gets the tax credit. I'm not sure what's gonna happen after April, if it will or not, uh, but this car doesn't. And that's a, a competitive disadvantage, truly. But this video is about the driving, and the driving is stellar. So a couple things I want to do left. I want to drive it hard. Uh, maybe not like shredding it up a back road. I imagine it's going to be the same as Ionic 5. I don't really think there, there's really many roads where I'm near right now. But if I can send it around a highway on-ramp, we're definitely going to do that. And uh, I'd like to just cruise down the highway, talk about the driver assistance. This car has HDA2. The standard car gets HDA1. I want to talk about that and what happens. So we got some driving to do, and then uh, keep an eye out for a future video where I should be able to do some highway efficiency testing, which I'm really looking forward to doing. So you join me kind of on a fast back road rather than the highway, but certainly quick enough where I can demonstrate some of my favorite functions of the driver assistance system. Now, the Hyundai systems never score that well in our hogback challenge. However, in practice, they work really well, and I'm actually a big fan. The one thing I think they need to improve on are the driver safety interactions, but I'll leave that for when we can get the full review on the hogback. So the first thing we can do is turn on active lane centering. Now, of course, there's lane departure that pushes you back in, but lane centering is uh, really cool because I believe it's the only car that I can think of that separates it from the adaptive cruise control. So I'm controlling the speed of the vehicle right now, and this little green wheel up here indicates that it's lane centering around, and that is really an underrated feature. It's something I use all the time because very rarely do I want to put it on adaptive cruise and drive around my city, um, but this I can kind of keep on always and it's just steering down the center of the lane. If I need to take over, I can just put in a steering input and it locks back in whenever it can find another lane. To me, I use this all the time. I'm a big fan of the um, you know constant lane centering function. Then you have your adaptive cruise control and it says smart cruise control conditions not met and that was because I was on the brake pedal. So now I've set the speed to, I don't know, let's set it up to 35, 45, 50 miles an hour down this road. We have a bunch of different distance settings. So one, two, three, four distance settings. And we're just cruising along here in adaptive cruise control with lane centering. Now on the highway, we would get something called HDA would pop up and it's called highway driving assist. And what highway drive assist does is it actually allows for lane changes automatically. It scooches over if there's a car near you and uh, overall just makes the highway drive awesome. It's really a good system. I've done tons of miles with you on range tests and other things, road trips and Ionics to sh really showcase how great this system truly is. And it is really good. It's not, you know, autopilot good, but it's certainly up there. Uh, it's not hands-free. It is a non-capacitive wheel. It's a torque input wheel, but again, it works really well. The one nice thing that the limited version of the Ionic 6 comes with are these actual little cameras when I put the signal on that shows up with a camera here uh, to show what's in your blind spot. Unfortunately, like the Ionic 5, it's only available in the top spec trim. I wish it, it was available in the SEL trim. I also wish the sunroof was available in the SEL trim. So they're really specking it similar to Ionic 5, which those are really the, the two issues I have with, with the middle trim. And unfortunately, that's going to be the volume trim, not the base or the max, which I really think they should have bumped more volume up on either side, but I'm not a product planner, so uh, it's not, not my world. I just see what you guys ask for, and um, you know, there's a bunch of SELs available all the time for Ionic 5s, and everyone wants either the base, the SE, or the Limited, is my impression. So 
that's some of the driver assistance for you. And now we can really talk about, now that we're gonna get up to about 60 miles an hour on this road, let's talk highway cruising and, and feel and sound. It's so quiet in here. Again, the loudest thing is still the fan for the air conditioning. And even that's not that intrusive. I can barely hear cars around me. It just rides perfectly. The impact noises are minimal with the electric adapted tire. The drivetrain is dead silent. There are some electric sounds you can pipe into the interior. That's all pretty stupid in my opinion. It's just like, yeah, let's just drive across the country in this thing. You gotta manually select your charging stations. I will die on that hill. But uh, in terms of ride comfort, cruisability, so good it is so good so well optimized for covering distance it truly is hyundai's grand tour their gt this is the car you can cruise on a back road look really cool doing it from the front at least and then you know do much of miles on the highway on the weekends it's gonna be a great car it really is when it goes on sale i'm really curious how many people choose to buy this over the Ionic 5. I wonder if that range and efficiency bump will really sway people to this shape more so than the Ionic 5. Me personally, I would give up the efficiency and range of this car and get the Ionic 5 over the Ionic 6, but that is just my personal opinion. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Let's see if we can find anything to hustle this car around quickly. I did earlier off camera uh, drive it down a back road. Now I find myself heading back into the city, sadly. But I'll give you my impressions of the sporty driving. And then, of course, when we get it on track or we get it up back in Colorado, I'll do some, some real hardcore driving. It's pretty much identical in a performance setting to the Ionic 5. It feels maybe a little bit less top heavy, if you will. It's pretty nice. But coming into a corner, it turns in well. It holds the line well. And the best part about this whole thing is having that juicier rear motor than the front. So when you stab the throttle on corner exit, you can actually come out of corners with straight angle on the wheel. It's not nearly as hardcore as the EV6 GT that I tested, but the actual driving dynamics of this car and that have a lot of similarities. And so uh, this is actually really fun on a back road. It's tuned well and, uh, you know, it definitely lives up to the hype that the Ionic 5 uh, paved its way in front of it. It is really very nicely tuned. So that's sort of my driving review of it. I wish I was able to show you some sporty driving, but it's not so important to include that in this review. The performance driving is just as good as Ionic 5. And uh, it's quiet on the highway, quiet cruising at speed. I can't wait to get it to Colorado where I can really spend time and make a super in-depth video for you about how it drives in different environments. But my first impressions driving it for the first time is sitting here, I feel no difference to Ionic 5. I feel like I'm sitting quite high. And so if you're familiar with that car, it's great. If you're not familiar with that car, what it means is it's quiet. The suspension isn't super soft or super hard. It's perfectly tuned. The tires are very well suited for the car. The handling balance of the vehicle, the chassis control, the inputs as the driver from the brake pedal, the accelerator pedal, all the stuff a driver nerd would care about, all really good. And um, that's where this car shines. It drives way better than its competition. The Model 3 uh, certainly is nowhere near as comfortable on the highway, nowhere near as quiet as this, uh, but the Model 3 is probably a bit more fun on a back road, a bit more sporty, a bit more eager to, to turn and move around. And the Model 3 has a much better charging network for road trips. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and, and I prefer autopilot to HDA. Uh, even though this is a very good system, autopilot's just a step above in, in my user experience at least. So uh, I'll give you my final thoughts as I arrive back before we do some efficiency testing, which I'm sort of limiting the driving review to do more efficiency testing because I know that's what you guys will be interested in. So let's go do some of that and uh, we'll wrap up this video here in a moment. And well, there you have it. I am an idiot and totally forgot to film my outro thoughts while I had the car. I was actually filming for some other channels. Take a look at my thoughts on out of spec guide where I compare the Ionic 6 to a Tesla Model 3. Uh, and, and really run through that value play and look at the car beyond just the driving dynamics, which this re review really was. Um, you know, the Ionic 6, uh, now that I've had a few days to think about it, I filmed this video, I don't know, maybe four or five days ago, something like that. 
Uh, it really left me with a great impression of a driving car or a good driving car. But the thing for me is I can get that same great driving impression in an Ionic 5, give up some range, but have a way cooler, more practical car. And so for me, I'm Ionic 5 all day long. Uh, you know, for sure the Tesla is going to be just a much easier overall ownership experience throughout the lifetime of the vehicle. But some people don't want to own a Tesla for whatever reason or are looking for something different or, you know, unique on the road. And this is certainly going to be that for the time being. Ionic 6s have already started deliveries and they've reached dealerships across the U.S. So keep an eye at your local dealer. Perhaps you can snag one at Sticker if you're lucky. The buying process is one of the problems with Hyundai dealers, just in my experience with friends buying these cars that, you know, it's such a good product, sort of let down. I'm not saying every dealer is bad, but many of them certainly are tough to work with. So um, there you have it, and that's the end of the driving review for the Hyundai Ionic 6. Thanks for tuning in. Keep an eye on more. I should have an efficiency video coming either tomorrow or the day after this one goes live, and uh, I think you guys will be surprised at the efficiency we saw in this car. I'm not going to tell you how good or bad it was, but uh, coming soon. Thanks for tuning in. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>